my voice going out on uh, on the classroom yeah <coughs> hello yeah cool um, okay so um, I, I I wasn't successful with uh, getting uh, haiku um, package source going on Haiku, um, so I started to look around at um, other platforms to uh, to try out. Um, so at the moment IBM is trying to uh, do what Sun was doing uh, nearly 10 years ago and um, appearing friendly and offering free services and one of the things is at the moment they have a, a developer program where you can get access to IBM uh, power systems running AIX and um, i5 um, for building stuff on and testing. So I signed up um, for, the, uh, for the program. And um, so you basically, <laughs> uh, you, you apply on the site and they give you like two, hour, uh, two week slots um, on a Power 6 or Power 7 or Power 8 system running AIX 6, 7, 7, 1. So I started off um, on AIX 7.1 on a Power 8 um, and tried to get things uh, booting. Now, in theory, this is a supported uh, platform in package source. And man. Uh, so the first thing is actually uh, uh, IBM offer you two images of, to try. One of them is what they call a porting image, so if you're porting software to AIX you can use this image and the other one is um, a standard AIX image or what they classify as standard. Now I don't know if you can see but uh, the fourth row down is the amount of free memory. Now that's how much memory from a two gigabyte, uh, a system with two gigabytes of RAM allocated uh, comes with out of the box. Now it turns out that actually uh, IBM um, automatically turn on things like Tivoli um, and things like that on the image that they supply. So that sits there and chews up all the RAM. And the other thing is, is also the AIX resource manager consumes whatever else is left. Um, so you have a whole 17 megabytes of RAM to, <laughs> to play with. Um, so uh, that's one of the things. Um, I kind of had several attempts at trying to get um, package source going and uh, the second to last time um, they, on, the, on the images that they provide not only do they provide GCC but they also provide what they call their uh, XLC um, uh, compiler and so I tried to bootstrap package source with uh, GCC and Bootstrap completed fine, and then so what you want to do is start a bulk build process uh, which would go about scanning the entire package source tree, generating your list of dependencies, and go, go about building stuff. So I bootstrapped with GCC, kicked off a bulk build which would start scanning, and scan would just get to like 5,000 packages and stop. No errors, nothing logged. So. Um, this is with uh, the proper AT&T KSH as the default shell. So I s modified the, the settings file and uh, used PD, the public domain KSH, um, fired it off and I got this uh, realloc failed. So it was lack of RAM so I freed up some RAM and then with ULimit bumped the limit up to 256 megabytes fired it off again and it seg faulted. So now I've got this core dump file, um, looked around and there's a command called dbx which is their uh, debugger which you can point to core files. Turned out that wasn't installed, couldn't install it because they hadn't provided the dependencies. Um, so this time I thought, they're actually quite active on Twitter so you can ping them questions. Um, so whilst they were waiting to kind of get me an answer of where the dependencies are, I went back and did uh, bootstrapped again, but without uh, GCC. 
This time I got a different error, which was this uh, no process to read data root into pipe. Um, and then one last time I modified the script, so out of the box it used public domain KSH. And again, it went back to memory for core dump. So I gave up on this. Um, and then <laughs> uh, my last attempt, which I um, tried AIX, um, I thought maybe I'll try the other image. I might have more success. So this is the porting image I'm going to go and try this time. So I opened up a reservation, got the new image, tried to bootstrap, and couldn't even bootstrap. It's kind of the whole thing blew up, and I've got this error message. And actually, Googling around um, uh, for the ID uh, takes you to this page. And it turns out this is an error that was discovered back in 2011. Um, IBM broke something in their latest and greatest service pack. And what you need to do is basically not uh, downgrade from whatever version that you have to an older version. Uh, and at that point, I thought, you know, if you want AIX. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> high five. And actually, I mean, it baffles me how, as uh, in, in, the, in the open source space, we don't have these problems, and yet um, we compete against that. Um, FreeBSD kind of worked out the uh, work to that issue. Yeah. Um, the funny thing was, was uh, there's one package in package source called uh, standalone TCSH. And this, this package basically violates the rules of the packaging system, which is it ignores the prefix that everything gets installed onto and just puts the statically linked TCSH into slash bin. Which is a problem because FreeBSD comes with its own copy of TCSH. And if you're bulk building, the bulk build process would get to this package, install it, remove it, and then move on to the next package. And now you're minus TCSH. And if your login shell is TCSH, the next time you go to connect. <laughs> and it is TC shell by default. Uh, right. right. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, that was my login shell, and it was really funny, actually, my reaction to this, because I, my automatic thing was, was, oh, my God, I've been hacked. Uh, <laughs> someone's, uh, and so I've, been, I've continued with the uh, FreeBSD stuff, because it's, it just works, and I can um, do them over and over again. Okay. Um, so after that, I started looking at Solaris. Um, I put out a call on um, social media again, and I got pointed to these guys called um, Open Cashew. Um, and they, they have their own SysV packaging system for Solaris. And they have a cluster of systems. And if you're doing open source work, they'll give you access to these systems uh, for building on. Um, so on their on their cluster, they've actually got Solaris 9, 10, 11 on x86 and Spark. Um, I couldn't get package source gain on Solaris 9. Uh, and on Solaris 10, x86, uh, there's some issues uh, which I couldn't uh, get around. Uh, but I managed to uh, do the bulk builds on the Spark versions of 10 and 11 and uh, x86 version of uh, 11. The problem uh, with Solaris, specifically with 10, is your user land is broken up um, with multiple instances of utility. So depending on what you're doing, uh, you would set up your path with the relevant components to build against. Um, and that's somewhat of a problem with uh, when you're trying to get stuff going on um, Solaris 10. Uh, the other thing was was that um, they do regular updates of the operating system, and with that, their libc gets added new functionality. So though you've got Solaris 10, um, you may be missing some functionality in the older versions that are quite critical. So one thing uh, was that um, Mandoc uh, wouldn't build on uh, the old version of uh, Solaris 10. 
Uh, for Solaris 11, uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of deprecated um, that you would normally expect in a POSIX-like operating system. And uh, we have issues with that in package source, so we couldn't bootstrap. But if you switch over to the Sun compiler, it doesn't care and just kind of plows through and um, builds stuff. Um, I haven't actually tried running any of these binaries, but um, I'm sure there's going to be something that's going to bite you. Um, and then after that, it was OmniOS, which is a, a Lumos-based operating system. And uh, there's a different set of problems for this, which is um, their version of GetText is not usable for us in uh, package source because uh, it's built as a shared library, and we don't use the slash opt something um, slash lib um, in our builds. So get text is broken. I haven't, uh, I haven't found a solution for this, but one of them would be that maybe possibly build the OS version of get text as a static binary, and then in which case we work around that. But it depends on how, uh, how accepting they're going to be of accepting such a patch, or whether it's a feasible solution to ask a user to uh, recompile their get text as uh, static. Uh, OpenBSD. Um, so OpenBSD is uh, really interesting for building against because there's LibreSSL out of the box. Um, they've made the switch to the 64-bit timer. And I've uh, one of the NetBSD guys, uh, Rodent, um, had a Spark 64 system. So I fired off a bulk build on uh, the 5.6 uh, build uh, of OpenBSD. And uh, Brandon Mercer from the OpenBSD project gave me access to his AMD64 box. Um, numbers aren't that great. And the problem with the Spark 64 stuff is that uh, it's really the per core performance of the system isn't um, that good. So they expect, uh, you, they expect you to paralyze your workload, you know, build with make minus j, 48 or 96, which I couldn't really do in this situation because I only had four virtual CPUs. Um, so that took like a best part of a month to complete. Um, the AMD64 stuff, uh, so in FreeBSD and OpenBSD, we refer to the platforms as AMD64 um, or i386. Um, within package source, we don't use the operating systems assigned platform name. We have our own uh, naming convention, so we use x8664. Um, and so there's a lot of things that are applied if your platform is x864 in the make files of packages that are not applied to the OpenBSD build. Um, and that's kind of raised some other issues, which I'll talk, talk about in a minute. Um, Bitrig. Um, the number's even lower, but uh, that was an interesting uh, uh, platform to test against because basically it's OpenBSD, but with Clang as the default um, compiler. So it's, uh, which I guess you could do on OpenBSD, but uh, I, it wouldn't have the same kind of uh, changes. It would be in ports. Uh, so um, and that was that. Uh, and then I moved on to Dragonfly BSD. The Dragonfly BSD guys um, have this machine called Monster, uh, which is their 48 core Opteron, which they use for um, testing uh, various things. And uh, this was the build, the first attempt that was finished. Um, the interesting situation here was that uh, through building with uh, package source, uh, we found two uh, quite uh, major problems within their operating system, with, which caused deadlocks, um, which they fixed. Um, the nice thing here is that uh, I'm building with make minus J96, um, which is very cool. Uh, 
<laughs> so a complete build of like WebKit uh, completes in less than 45 minutes um, and takes up about 55 gigabytes of RAM uh, to do it. <laughs> uh, Uh, and then, so with the, going back to the IBM uh, thing, uh, aside from AIX, they also offer uh, Linux. Um, so you can choose uh, SUSE, Red Hat, um, or I think it might just be SUSE and Red Hat, actually. Um, so I, I picked a Power 8 system with uh, SUSE 12, and um, within a few weeks, uh, kind of completed this bulk build um, on there. The interesting thing is, is that the PowerPC64 Little Endian is something relatively new within the last few years. So though you'll have software that kind of doesn't have any uh, problems in the code, uh, you're tripped up because the auto tools, uh, if they're out of date, they're not going to pick this up and you get kind of weird issues uh, with things not building. And And that was the thing. Most of the time, actually, uh, it wasn't uh, dealing with uh, problems with code. It was actually uh, working around issues from um, autoconf and things like that. So um, uh, within the GNU software uh, ecosystem, there's a, uh, there's a common set of uh, header files and uh, libraries that uh, all the GNU utilities consume. And if you have an issue with, the, uh, with these uh, core utilities, suddenly you find that gzip doesn't build, um, get text doesn't build, and suddenly there's not a lot you can build from that uh, collection. Uh, and actually this was uh, one of the problems that uh, the check would fail and suddenly uh, I was kind of stuck. Another one is from uh, AutoConf, which is a, a script which tries to guess your operating system. Um, this is going back to the PowerPC64 Little Endian. Um, for OpenSSH, uh, that wasn't aware uh, of the Little Endian PowerPC64. So actually, <coughs> the uh, OpenSSH will compile on there. It wouldn't build until they patched it. Um, the problem with this is, is if this is really uh, out of date, you get things like uh, your build actually being held up because uh, your build will get to this, go, I can't detect the operating system and wait for like manual user input. So there was quite a few occurrences where I lost days of build time because um, it was just sitting there on a prompt. Um, and actually, when we're doing the builds, you can turn around and re uh, restrict your build time uh, Based on the CP, uh, sorry, based on CPU time. So if something is taking way too long, say um, more than an hour or so, um, the the build is aborted and moved on. Problem is, is that there is no such thing for uh, other resources. Like um, a common problem is also with bad mirrors. So lots of t uh, there's a daily routine of checking the actual build process to see that the build hasn't hung because there's lots of mirrors that you're f fetching from, um, and they're not connect uh, configured. So um, Xorg is particularly bad at this. Lots of lots of dead FTP mirrors, or um, FTPs that uh, FTP sites that just uh, don't work correctly. Um, Perl again. Uh, so actually, moving on from C, uh, the scripting languages, uh, if they're not behaving correctly, uh, can have a quite a catastrophic effect. More than actually what. Um, the C-based uh, uh, projects uh, would have. So, uh, like with Haiku, um, AIX, um, if Perl isn't working, package source doesn't really get very far uh, in the bulk build process, um, as in actually just setting up your environment before you've actually built anything. Um, for Python, uh, 
like on Bitrig at the moment, one of the reasons that the, the package count is so low is uh, Python 2.7 um, doesn't build yet, and that's nearly 5,000 packages that can't be built. Um, big problem. And <laughs> yeah, back to IQ. <laughs> it's like the crazy uncle, he keeps on going back. <laughs> Did I tell you about that time? Um, so through actually um, and doing all these bulk builds so far, actually, the things that have been flagged up in um, other projects. So Mandoc, Ingo Schwartz, um, went and got himself an open cashew account and uh, removed uh, all the modern POSIX features that were needed in Mandoc. So now Mandoc will build on Solaris 9 and onwards. Um, the PAX utility in FreeBSD uh, is missing various flags, but one of the things that we needed was the minus O flag. Um, that got added into FreeBSD. Um, the Dragonfly, the deadlock issues were fixed in their, uh, in their kernel. Um, for BSD make, uh, bulk building on uh, OpenBSD flagged up uh, an issue where they were doing mem copy on overlapping buffers, whereas they should have been using um, mem move. Um, and for OpenSSH, now as part of their workflow for release engineering, they're actually um, updating their config guess. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, it's, I've heard this the last three or four days where uh, just following procedures, not, I mean, you did, on many of these platforms, you didn't try to run the program Right. I mean, they weren't run testing, you were just building. Yes. But all the errors you found that were uh, a benefit to the other projects, at least the operating system projects, did you find, I think you said earlier that some of the uh, errors, build errors, were reported upstream to the, the application? Or did I misunderstand that? Uh, which, uh, uh, on which operating system? No, not the operating system, but if you found an error in a package in the, uh, I don't remember. Uh, a project's program, it was reported upstream to them, like for the uh, Kuva. Uh, but, you know, what we, uh, we saw this yesterday and the day before, just following procedures like that, it would seem like you wouldn't catch a lot of errors, but every time somebody says, oh yeah, just do this, and these things that should work, uh, have errors, and if you report them to the upstream project, but it turns out they will be your buddies because you're helping them. Yesterday at the JH build thing, where uh, uh, I'm going to say GNOME from now on because half the time that's what's said anyway. The GNOME project, they did this JH build thing where they were they cross build on FreeBSD, and initially they didn't care, but suddenly they started getting bug reports from FreeBSD users and fix them, and now they're happy. It's, we're best friends. Uh, and you've got the same thing going here, just doing, trying to do the builds, and you've caught all that stuff. And that's just uh, a couple nights ago at the Doc Lounge, I was going through one of those beginner introductory procedures and found a pretty obvious mistake in the instructions. It's been in there for like a year and a half. It's a constant iterative process, right? It's just kind of... And it, it's just surprising that uh, something... Uh, this isn't simple, but what I was doing was, was just really simple, just going through and trying to follow the instructions it gave. And even then, there are errors that were not immediately obvious until you actually did it. Well, it's the same idea as rubber ducky debugging. Okay. Which is where when you start walking through and you explain to the rubber duck exactly what you're doing, suddenly realize, oh wait, no I'm not. <laughs> there, uh, supposedly on Usenet, uh, the shell scripting groups, people would, there was one guy, somebody asked a question, how do I do this in shell? A bunch of people respond, and there was one guy who was responding and said, did you test that? And it turned out that no, most of the responses never worked, that because was, nobody ever tested it. Because nobody ever, or no, they, you assume you know things, until you start walking through them step by step, and then it's like, ew. Yeah. 
Anyone? Here? I, I, I agree with what Warren was saying. I think it's great that you uh, identified issues in so many different Imagine if you had uh, the continuous integration thing doing that. And again, that's not even that's not even getting to the point where you're test running any of the things you're building. But even with just that, look at all the stuff you can find. And actually, this is one of the nice things um, on the FreeBSD ports. You've got like a Poudrier, and we used to have Tinderbox. Um, the the system that we have in package source is more um, shell script based. Uh, but the problem is, is that in some of these environments, I'm running as an unprivileged user. Uh, so I can't have things like NFS mounts or union mounts and things like that. So um, I think that's probably going to be for the next step is looking at something like that because it's going to be, a, a, I'm going to be able to saturate the hardware better. Like with the Dragonfly BSD one, it's really, yes, okay, I'm a building with minus J96, but the thing is it's one package at a time, whereas actually I could probably um, saturate the hardware much better if I was building multiple things with a lower parallel build count, possibly. Um, building multiple things used to be a problem due to locking issues. Right. <coughs> I, I, had, uh, I had offered up a patch around about 1998 to uh, deal with this, uh, but uh, people didn't like my approach to it, but nobody came up with anything better later. Uh, so I can't remember whether its current behavior is to simply say, no, you know, the things are in use, so try again later. Uh, my version of the patch actually waited for the other operations Right. Well, and you could get more parallel parallelization with the uh, VMs on one machine. Right, but like if you're building on uh, an old G four, right. it, yeah. it doesn't help if you're building interrelated things. Well, also no, like some of the old systems that don't have uh, some of the operating systems don't have that functionality, right? Um, so there's a there's a framework within package source called pbulk, um, and literally it's a shell script that you uh, run. It will set up your environment, um, and then I think it spawns like uh, change routes, uh, and does the builds within there. Does it, does it require any other tools like is it Python based or something like that, or it's all shell? Uh, actually, so this is the thing. What why we need Py uh, Perl because Perl gets it, there's a, something within that. Uh, dependency list is uh, is Perl. So if Perl isn't working on your system, then you can't really do much. Right. Uh, I know you already had one that was Python based a long time ago, but I don't know what's And there is actually uh, th the other thing is is also like on these old systems, uh, like with the uh, the Power PC Max, it takes like three days to uh, scan the the ports tree. <laughs> um, so something uh, something that would save time would be kind of Gladly welcomed. Um, okay, thank you very much for turning up. Thank you. Thanks, guys.